Okay, well, I expect, well, if any more connect up, they will join in and more will connect via the video later on. So I'll begin our introduction to this, our last uh, speaker session of, as part of this uh, new Shoots in Ecumenism conference. Uh, for the next hour or so, we'll be sharing how ecumenical relationships play a role in the theological education experience. I'm your moderator, Matthew Kieswetter uh, from St. Andrew's Memorial Anglican Church in Kitchener, uh, or I should say Kitchener-Waterloo to evoke the Waterloo Declaration, a uh, full com communion between Anglicans and Lutherans in Canada. I was at that service about 20 years ago, and I'm Vice President of the Trinity Divinity Associates Executive. We are reaching from coast to coast for this session on the East Coast, Associate Professor of Practical Theology at the Atlantic School of Theology in Halifax, the Reverend Dr. David Sinos. He is the founder of Faith Forward, which is concerned with children's and family ministry. And on a personal note, I will add that I know Dave from when we used to live in the same city, and I was running a music and movie store at that time. So good to reconnect through this, David. Coming from the West Coast, we have the Reverend Dr. Richard Topping, President and Vice Chancellor of the Vancouver School of Theology and St. Andrew's Professor of Studies in the Reformed Tradition. Then we move to Toronto, the very Reverend Dr. Jeffrey Reddy, Director of the Orthodox School of Theology here at Trinity College, uh, Toronto, and also newly appointed Director of the Faculty of Divinity's Lilly Endowment Funded Pathways for Tomorrow initiative, called Reimagining Contemporary Ministries for a Renewing Church to help prepare Christian leaders for a post-Christendom ministry context. Father Jeffrey also leads the Holy Murbearers Orthodox Mission, which is based out of the Trinity College Chapel. And from coast to coast to across the street, we are very pleased to have with us the Right Reverend Dr. Stephen Andrews, Principal and Hallowell Professor of Biblical Interpretation at Wycliffe College. Bishop Stephen gave me a warm welcome some years ago when I was a student rep on the Ontario Provincial Commission on Theological Education, uh, which is where we first met. And we have from TST, uh, Reverend Dr. Pamela Kuchur, Executive Director of the Toronto School of Theology and the Jane and Jeffrey Martin Chair of Church and Community at Emmanuel College. In addition to being ordained in the United Methodist tradition, she is Ecumenical Associate of St. Luke's Anglican Church in Burlington, Ontario. Uh, those that are connecting uh, online are welcome to put any questions they might have for the panelists into the chat just throughout the session. Uh, we'll be starting with a one-on-one -on -one focus on each speaker, uh, and then after that we will simply move into a time of conversation and questions. Uh, and so let's begin with uh, each speaker taking a few moments to describe their educational uh, context and the ecumenical dynamics that are in play at this present moment. How about beginning uh, with Dr. Couture, again, overseeing TST. Uh, so would you share with us um, your context or contexts and how the ecumenical dynamics are at play uh, and being felt right now? Oh, and sorry, you'll just have to unmute there. Unmute, there yes. Go. Sure, I'm glad to do that. Um, I um, am, have been the executive director of Toronto School of Theology for the last few years. Um, and I've been teaching in, at Emmanuel College since uh, 2010. Um, before that, I was at two United Methodist schools in the United States and at Colgate Rochester, which was specifically an ecumenical, uh, self understood, understood itself to be ecumenical, although it was Baptist in or origin. So I've had the, I have the experience of, of being located both in, in um, uh, denominational colleges as well as ecumenical schools. And this administrative time that I've spent with the seven schools at Toronto School of Theology has certainly been, I would say, conditioned by the place that ecumenism has in, in uh, Toronto, um, Ontario, and Canada at the current moment. So for those of you who don't know the School of Toronto School of Theology. We, there are there are seven uh, member colleges. Uh, the manual is the United Church of Canada College. Uh, Knox is a Presbyterian College. Uh, Trinity Trinity is is Anglican, 
Wycliffe is Anglican, but they represent different forms of Anglicanism. And I'm not going to characterize those. I'll leave Stephen and, and Jeffrey to <laughs> characterize those. Um, and then we have uh, Regis, which is a Jesuit college, and St. Michael's, which is a faculty of theology um, in the Catholic intellectual uh, tradition. And then St. Augustine's, which is a diocesan um, Roman Catholic school. And they, so all of these different schools situate themselves very differently, not only within the tradition in which they're a part, but also within the larger ecumenical movement. So 50 years ago, 50-ish years ago, when TST was founded, the idea was that the schools could come together, could be able to do graduate education, could feed and be nourished by the differences and certainly could, could um, attempt to, to um, work out many of the, the kind of the intellectual issues in, in a classroom education. Um, that happened at both the, what we call the basic degree or second entry undergraduate degree level, as well as the graduate level. Although TST was really founded, I think, in order to create, bring graduate education into Toronto on, at, as a theology um, consortium. What's interesting in the way that the ecumenism has worked its way out, I would say in the last two years that I've been around or two and a half years that I've been directing TST is the dominance of the university. So you almost have the university as a, as kind of a second, well, a, a player as another entity which so the schools all have to nego negotiate with each other, but then they also have to negotiate with this entity, which is the university, especially the the kind of ramping up of quality assurance processes that universities are going are are ramping up worldwide. So um, quality assurance processes came into the university in in kind of full form around 2010. I had been part of a couple of those processes in other countries in 2011, 12, 13, thereabouts, as it began to take hold internationally. And now this is a process that 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 the Ministry um, of Ontario depends upon and delegates to its universities. So we have a normative situation in the University of Toronto having to do with the norms of, of um, the secular university and how those norms are represented in Canadian society. And then we have the seven schools who will be eager to remind you about their ecclesial difference and their ecclesial identity. So I was really interested in the email that I had gotten um, just shortly about how this conversation was emerging and the idea of a common mission. Because if I said anything about a common mission, I think I would have seven principles and deans immediately reminding me of ecclesial difference. And then the question is, when we try to say ecclesial difference, do people feel secure enough in that difference and being able to articulate, like, articulate that difference in order to be able to come together for a common mission. And I think that's what TST really struggles with on a day-by-day -day basis. Um, so, um, and I would say that we do that fairly successfully. Um, I don't think, you know, we all know that, that, the, that the, the conflicts between, within individual denominations are stronger than the conflicts across denominations in Christianity, as well as the, the conflicts now are played out at many times in the interface between social issues and our theological understandings of them rather than specifically doctrinal issues. Um, there's always this kind of interplay that, that is occurring. I think the way that comes up in, at TST, even in recent meetings, is the question about the way that both Ontario and Canada's human rights codes um, and, the, and the norms and values in those codes interface with um, the specific ecclesial expressions and commitments made by seven different colleges and how those are different. So I would say that's, that's the, those are the places where there's tension and the places where there's certainly a strong commitment to a common mission, and that's an educational mission, and it's a mission to be an educational 
um, consortium for the sake specifically of graduate education, but but also uh, second entry undergraduate education, uh, where we where we can uh, contribute to to a wider conversation. I'd be remiss without saying that the other component in this is how each denomination and each expression of that denomination relates to the interfaith world and to the secular but not religious world or the not we're not even secular but not religious we just aren't their world if you want to call it that um, of students who come into our classrooms sometimes we have people who are highly religious sometimes we have people who are seekers some people times we have people who are representatives of other of other practicing traditions and sometimes they're just there without any you know serious um a religious commitment at all and that i will say has really changed the classrooms that I've been in since 2010. And that is a being part of the Canadian diversity and the, the Toronto population of diversity um, is really the, the um, challenge I think that we face at TST, broadly speaking. So I think that's my few minutes of introduction of TST and I'm eager to hear what my colleagues have to say. Oh, thank you. Very interesting and enlightening. And how about for our next spotlight, we'll move to Vancouver with uh, uh, Richard Topping. And as you occupy, I think, a similar sort of parallel position within the Vancouver School of Theology. So I'm curious if that resonates uh, with you or any differences you might point out. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much, Matthew. And thank you to Trinity uh, for college for inviting me to, to offer my thoughts today on ecumenism. Um, I was educated at the Toronto School of Theology. I'm a graduate of Wycliffe and St. Mike's is a, a, a my degree. So um, it's funny how ecumenism for me and my colleagues, all of whom teach at VST, is just normal. Uh, it, it's an achievement. It's uh, it's something we've done and we assume in the work that we do. Um, I've been here as the president of the school for nine years. And before that, I was four years as professor of theology. Um, Vancouver School of Theology was actually born in 1971 in anticipation of a merger between the United Church and the Anglican Church, which didn't happen. But I tell people, should it occur, we're ready. Uh, we have prepared ourselves. Uh, the Presbyterians associated with the school in the 1980s. Um, ecumenism um, is very live here. In 1983, the International Meeting of the World, uh, uh, the World uh, Communion of Churches, so, so, uh, the ecumenical body, T tell me the name. The please, Stephen Council, Council World of Council of Churches. There, they held their meeting on the campus here at VST, and there's great memories when I interview our uh, graduates about uh, Archbishop Tutu uh, getting past the authorities to come on campus uh, to, to great rejoicing. Um, if you go to this day to Bossy, which is an ecumenical center in Switzerland, you will see there, I think it's still there, the totem pole from outside of, uh, from right off the VST property, which was uh, then transported to that school. So ecumenism is strong in the Vancouver School of Theology. Uh, the founding vision of the school was much stronger than uh, three partners that we have now. Um, and it's, it's a different sort of arrangement where it comes to teaching. We don't have separate colleges. We're all in the same college. And, and that, creates, um, that creates both blessing and challenge, right? Because uh, as, as C.S. Lewis talks about in mere Christianity, there's the front hallway Christianity, and then there are the rooms. So we try to tend to both of those. So we share the, theology classes. We share classes around pastoral theology. But then we also have a series of what we call DDFs, Directors of Denominational Formation. And we, uh, we do parse ourselves out. And maybe it's represented in the way we worship. On Tuesdays, denominations worship on their own. And then on Thursdays, we have, uh, we have ecumenical uh, worship together. Uh, we try to learn from each other. Uh, there is the uh, challenge, for example, of uh, formation and online delivery, as well as part-time students. And how do we do that? And the Anglicans uh, got together and got a great idea of teaching some courses in an intensive format over the course of a series of weekends. So you do get down the rhythms of prayer. And uh, it was such a popular idea that now the Presbyterians and the United Church imitates it in, in their own work and formation. So that's one of the, the great, uh, the, the innovation is shared and we learn from each other. I would say the thing that I've noticed most about the Vancouver School of Theology in its current life 
um, where ecumenism is the most live. I, I would say, I would just use the word friendship. Uh, we have students over the course of time here who have had little or no exposure to denominations other than their own, really. But they develop, uh, I would call them holy friendships with people from other denominational uh, traditions that last, that last a lifetime. Uh, they're still in touch with each other. I, I think that's a great witness to the gospel. Um, we have a Facebook page for alumni and then for each of the graduate years. And it's really uh, interesting and lively to see the way in which they resource each other, uh, keep up to date with each other, the way they cooperate in local communities and their collegiality in the work, because ecumenism is just taken for granted. It's almost a tacit di dimension uh, of their education. So in congregational ministry and scholarship, they write things together and in social action in communities and, and in projects I've noticed around the country that DST graduates uh, do tend to work together and are, are particularly good at uh, working with a variety of denominations. I would say if I'm noticing anything lately, it's that that ecumenism is expanding. Um, I have a slide from our convocation, which took place a week ago, and there's four people in the picture. And it's not atypical. There's a man called Hubert, who's Niska. There's two Hawaiian students, Kawanoi and Clara. And then beside them, wearing a hood, is Father Harant, who's Armenian Orthodox and who is the ecumenical officer for the whole of the church with his office in Lebanon. Um, it's spectacular that they all get to know one another, that they share common interests, that they are humane and cooperative and listen. Um, I, I find that, uh, again, a great witness to the gospel. Uh, VST's expansion on the ecumenical front would be Pentecostals, Baptists, Orthodox, Mennonites, Lutherans. Uh, some of this is born of necessity, but hey, God uses necessity, <laughs> uh, financial and numerical, and just expedience sometimes, uh, sometimes move it. Um, our student body is made up of Anglican, United, and Presbyterian students, about 70%, but the largest cohort of students in a whole student body are other Christians. Um, and I would character that, characterize that group of other Christians with the term, uh, something like maybe sojourner, evangelicals. That is that there, there are people who love the emphasis at DST on justice and inclusivity that comes through in mainline Protestantism and in the Anglican church. And they also bring a fairly robust Christology and a Trinitarian theology, uh, which is the engine that, that drives that interest for them. And th this is a gift, I think, to us at VST because it blurs all the familiar boundaries. It pushes us out of silos. We, we thought we had the appropriate number of file folders in the drawer and we're always having to add new ones. And it's a confusion, I think, born of the Holy Spirit. Um, the, the, the other thing that is delightful is you get a student from free church traditions. I remember once reading the Apostles' Creed at the beginning of a theology class and I was asked, did you write that? That's very impressive. Um, um, the, the great benefit um, of free church people is that they're helping mainline Christians learn how to be missionaries to a culture we thought we owned. Um, they've never been established. They, most of them don't have Canada in their name, and they have things to teach us about how to be Christian without most favored religion status. Um, the experience of leadership, uh, of worship from, tradition, uh, from traditions not our own is both fun and uh, slightly uncomfortable. One is tempted to use the word enthusiastic. Um, and non-mainline Christians experience Anglican worship and note the, the way in which it's filled with scriptural illusion um, and how uh, I often in my theology class will use the Anglican experience, the way the pattern within which scripture is read to teach script, uh, when we say we believe in the authority of the Bible, you know, the texts are read in a certain order and you stand for the gospel. I think we're being taught how to read the book. Um, and students find that helpful and appreciate um, that because it's not part of their own life. Um, the other thing this does is it means there is a theological and ecclesiastical migration to the main line. Um, it's part of the ecology of recruitment for not only our school, but for uh, the denominations we support. Uh, lots of students come with an inkling for catechesis. Uh, uh, Dr. Couture was talking about people who don't always arrive with a strong sense of call. They're figuring it out. They're curious and, and they find themselves. We, we have classes. Uh, of people like that. 
And it actually provides a certain kind of freedom for people who thought they knew why they were there, but who have questions. And those kinds of conversations are life-giving. Um, we have one student, an Anglican student, actually. And when students gather, we asked her, how did you end up here? And she said something like, well, you know, I've started to go to an Anglican church and all my friends are secular and I've noticed how bad you are at communicating to them. So I thought I'd come to your school so I can help you. <laughs> Thank you. Next. <laughs> Anyhow, um, but they find a home with us, bring vitality to us. And I guess my, my worry sometimes as a, a president of a theological school is we get these people who are full of enthusiasm, who have robust faith at times. And I'm just worried about whether or not we socialize them into an ethos uh, or uh, let me say, I guess we need to be careful not to strain out the gifts that they bring to the church in our attempts to hold on to ethos and values. Uh, I think we need to be careful what we mean when we say those things. Um, and uh, uh, especially when people transfer into denominations, uh, it, it's I, I find all that very interesting, especially when it comes to talking about post-colonialism. Uh, there's also international students that join us. And again, they don't fit the, uh, I think ecumen ecumenism has gone international. Uh, they don't fit into ready-made denominational ca uh, categories. They aren't habituated in the narrative of decline and they challenge it in the classroom. Um, I had an Indonesian student put up his hand when the narrative of decline was being trotted out. And he said, uh, hmm, I wonder who you're counting when you say the church is in decline. And it was quiet and we were duly chastised. But there's a new awareness of the global church and the weight of things in the three-quarter world. Um, they ask questions, actually. This was mentioned earlier as well. They ask questions about theological education in the context of the university campus and both what that gets us and what that costs us, because that's uh, not part of their experience in the parts of the world from which they come. I like it because they create bandwidth. They show us the wide birth of the Christian church. You know, 40% of Christians are in Africa. Um, locally and internationally, uh, it, it causes us to speak in the classroom in an ecumenical school with care because the they you're talking about are there and uh, can find their feet and, and speak up from their perspectives. And it really helps us avoid the silos when everybody's in the room. Um, our students bring with them the theologians they want us to read, like from the Philippines and from Indonesia and from Africa. Um, in my theology class, we do a section on religious pluralism, and I have a professor from Jakarta Theological Seminary, Joas Adesa Prayeta, come in and talk about religious pluralism in a predominantly Muslim context, which is a different take th th than our own. Uh, a couple of things in conclusion, the indigenous church I'm noticing is maybe the most ecumenical. <laughs> um, one of the things I'm learning through our indigenous studies program is that indigenous churches, well, they are denominational. They tend to think more in terms of uh, community. They tend to think more of their social location, the land where they live, working together for the community, being a resource to the community is, uh, is second nature. We have a program called the Teaching House that moves around with uh, Ray Aldred, graduate of, uh, of Wycliffe and a professor here where theological education goes on the road, where communities are interviewed about what they need and then resources are brought to bear at the request of the community. Um, we've committed to having an indigenous instructor here every semester and it produces the most ecumenical classes because it's a common interest of all of our students. The students from the Anglican, United Presbyterian, and Christian Air and Missionary Alliance, they're all interested in truth and reconciliation. It tends to be a center of gravity at our school. And finally, again, just to mention something that was talked about, the in interreligious program. Um, I think in our school, if we have 10 people from other faith traditions, that's a lot. But uh, the use of the United Church calls this the broader, broader ecumenism, religious pluralism. Um, and lots of people take Christian theology classes who are preparing to be spiritual care workers in public institutions. It's always a bit of a, you know, have to do a double take when the best student in introduction to Christian theology is a Buddhist. Um, um, she, she said in the class after she finished it that she found the piece on the Trinity very interesting and that from now on when people 
in her world misrepresented the the trinity she would stick up for us <laughs> which is really uh delightful uh, makes me think of some of the work of charles taylor where he talks about overlapping consensus and how we can find points of commonality for the common good with people of multiple faith traditions or or without a faith tradition or as something in the theology of Karl Barth where he talks about because of our unconditioned commitment to the gospel we have conditional commitments to all kinds of humane uh, movements justice movements in our time so thank you thank you very interesting it's yeah surprising but very uh, yeah, heartening things there thank you and uh, how about we move to Bishop uh, Stephen at uh, Wycliffe Thank you very much, Matthew, and uh, thank you to uh, Trinity for offering this opportunity to uh, chat together. And uh, thank you very much, Richard, for that very rich um, uh, description of what's going on at PST. A lot of what you say, of course, would would reflect, um, uh, would be a mirror of what happens here, both, I think, at Trinity and Wycliffe. Uh, one of the interesting things is that uh, even within Anglicanism, uh, you know, we might uh, understand the uh, Anglican Church as a kind of uh, ecumenical experiment, um, because we do have two different seminaries uh, right across the street from one another, one of them born uh, from uh, a high church Anglo-Catholic background, a uh, result of the Tractarian movement uh, in the uh, 18th century, 19th century, and then you have Wycliffe College, uh, which at the end of the 19th century was established as a protest against the rise of Tractarianism in, in Toronto and the fact that um, largely uh, Protestant, uh, Irish Protestants uh, weren't being given access to the corridors of power in the church. So uh, Wycliffe was uh, founded in 1877. Um, so we've lived we've lived within our denomination with these tensions, and uh, at, at some points, you know, the rivalries were 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 really stark. And uh, stories are told about uh, the way that people used to uh, play tricks on one another between Wycliffe and Trinity. Maybe that was part of your experience, uh, Richard, in your time. I don't know, but uh, but uh, these days we get on uh, a lot better in part because of the similar challenges that we face in the church and we realize that we can't uh, build the church, uh, particularly if our aspiration is to build the church to look something like the kingdom of God if we're uh, continually in uh, states of conflict. Having said that, the kind of differences that we have between our traditions uh, is uh, mutually uh, productive uh, as we seek to respond to one another in Christian charity. Um, our own institution, because it's established in the evangelical tradition, um, means that uh, we are uh, we we collect a lot of folks who come from uh, outside of the mainline denominations. Uh, they are broadly evangelical churches. Uh, we, at uh, one point last year, we counted uh, 60 different kind of church traditions that were represented amongst our students. And um, so that's, that, that means that uh, I think that the experience that one would have as a student at Wycliffe College would be this, would be this kind of ecumenical um, impression, uh, which uh, our college is rooted in the Anglican tradition. We uh, we we pray together every day using the Book of Common Prayer or the Book of Alternative Services in a liturgical form. But um, having said that, only 40% of our overall student population would identify themselves as Anglican. And so that has really made our uh, experience of, of the church and of one another uh, quite interesting. You know, you can, in our uh, theology classes, you, you'll have, uh, you know, Pado-Baptists, and believer Baptists, and uh, all trying to sort of come to a common understanding, or at least understand one another uh, around the nature of the sacraments. Um, uh, the we we hope we like to think that uh, that these differences that people bring uh, in their ecclesial traditions uh, help us grow deeper in our own understanding of our own traditions. In some cases. Um, it has shifted people in their own allegiances. It's not uncommon for, uh, I know some cases actually, where Anglicans have come to Wycliffe College as Anglicans and have emerged uh, as uh, members of another uh, tradition, ecclesial tradition. 
Uh, more commonly, of course, we see people coming to Wycliffe College who come from outside uh, the Anglican tradition and then discover something within this tradition that uh, they find attractive. Uh, they establish, establish friendships and relationships and, uh, and to come to identify themselves as members of that community and then move on to leadership positions. So you'll find, uh, I think broadly among uh, the graduates of Wycliffe College, people who began uh, their Christian lives and even uh, into early um, parts of their uh, sense of vocation uh, as people from outside the Anglican tradition now uh, becoming members of the Anglican Church. Um, some of the uh, consequences of that for us as a theological college is that uh, we have to be very conscious of the variety and distinctions of, uh, of our different students and to try to adapt what we do. So uh, although we do have uh, chapel services uh, and morning and evening prayer drawn from the Anglican, Anglican tradition, uh, we do uh, identify certain services where we try to bring in uh, other liturgical forms from other traditions uh, and some so-called non-liturgical uh, churches. And uh, in some respects, uh, one might think that we're uh, adopting sort of non-Anglican ways of worship, but uh, again, thinking of the Anglican Church itself as a kind of ecumenical experiment, uh, we're coming to see that there is no one way of Anglican worship. Uh, th there is in the Anglican Church of Canada one authorized liturgical form, which is the Book of Common Prayer. The Book of Alternative Services is still an alternative services book and requires the permission of bishops in uh, in their jurisdictions for uh, the church to use, um, but uh, but now because of uh, the uh, pro proliferation of liturgies uh, within the communion and uh, borrowing from other traditions, uh, you can go to uh, you know a host of different Anglican churches and never realize that they hold sort of uh, Anglicanism as their common uh, source. In fact, we have one graduate from uh, Wycliffe College who is the pastor of a very prominent Baptist church here in Toronto. And uh, people often refer to his church as Anglo-Baptist um, uh, because he's, he is very liturgical. And in fact, uh, the church is, uh, you know, thinking liturgically is more Anglican than uh, a number of our Anglican churches. Uh, if you go down the road, you can uh, find yourself in an Anglican church, which uses neither the Book of Common Prayer nor the Book of Alternative Services. Um, so we've tried to kind of adapt to that and to give students uh, an experience of the breadth of, of Anglican worship. And also in our theology and pastoral leadership classes, uh, we seek to interact uh, with a variety of, of perspectives. Um, and part of, part of the reason that we're committed to this is because there's a sense in which our, our own faculty uh, would regard themselves as ecumenists. Uh, some of them come from different uh, ecclesial traditions themselves, Evangelical Free Church, uh, Methodist Church, uh, what have you. But, uh, but they've also had kind of broad experiences of the church. A uh, number of them have been missionaries. Uh, we have uh, a number of uh, faculty that have been members of uh, national and international uh, dialogues with uh, other traditions. Uh, Joe Mangina comes to mind. He's been a longtime member of the Anglican Roman Catholic dialogue here in, in Canada. And more importantly, I think uh, when our faculty teach about the church and write uh, about the church, uh, they recognize uh, their uh, work as being something that they want to benefit the whole church and not just one particular expression of it. So there's a sense in which, um, you know, even within sort of what we regard as evangelical Anglicanism, there's this great variety uh, of, of expressions of church, uh, which is continually influenced by our engagement uh, with folks from outside our own uh, particular tradition. 
Thank you very much. Really appreciate yeah, the thoughts and uh, um, certainly my experience as a Trinity student. I'm glad that when I was there that the uh, uh, friendship, there was more friendship than rivalry and in the interactions between the students at, across the streets. So uh, let's move across the street back to Trinity College and to the uh, Orthodox stream though within Trinity. So Father Jeffrey, what would you like to share about your context? Thank you. Um, so as we'll have heard in the introduction, I'm the director of the Orthodox School of Theology here at Trinity College, and I teach courses mainly in liturgy, Bible, and pastoral studies. And to keep things as brief as possible, there's a lot we can talk about in terms of ecumenical endeavor here, but I'd like to give you like three quick snapshots that represent or capture something of the ecumenical facets of my academic context. And they refer to the recent past, my current situation, and the near future. So looking to the recent past, I want to point to the very formation of this Orthodox School of Theology here at Trinity College as a profound expression of precisely that receptive ecumenism or sharing of gifts of which so many at this conference have already spoken. When Trinity College provided a generous home for what was then a small Orthodox studies program more than 15 years ago, it was in keeping with what Anglicans and Orthodox have been about for centuries not only a deep friendship between us, but we could speak at length about commonalities and the way our communions of churches are structured, about the living tradition that we adhere to in our approach to theology and so on. And there's even a shared heritage in the spiritual character of the early Celtic and English churches steeped as they were in Eastern Christian theology and monastic practice, which is something I hope you'll stick around this afternoon for uh, with our Orthodox Vespers, we'll be reflecting a little bit on. Suffice to say, we genuinely bring out the best in one another. But as beautiful a model of hospitality, of receptive ecumenism as this is, it's not enough. It's far from where we should be. Surely there's more to what we're called to do as Christians than simply playing nice, even very nice, with one another. Which brings me to my second snapshot and a glimpse at the current situation here. To illustrate kind of where we're at within the Orthodox School of Theology, let me tell you briefly about my summer course that is this May-June term that's on right now. It's called the Church of the Margins, and I expect somewhat unusually for a summer course, it has 33 students. And bear with me as I give you a breakdown of the demographics. Of those 33, 10 are from the Eastern or Byzantine Orthodox tradition across five different backgrounds. Four are from the Oriental Orthodox tradition, from both Coptic and Syrian Malankara traditions. Nine are Anglican, although I should hasten to say it's ecumenical as well. I think five of them are from Wycliffe and four from Trinity. Two Roman Catholic, two Melkite or Eastern Catholics, two United Church, two Presbyterian, one Lutheran, and one Evangelical Protestant. This is not at all atypical of the courses I've been teaching over the last couple of years. So you might wonder, how does this actually work? And it's not like with this course that we're treating some surface level issue in like an anodyne way. The course is what it says, the church of the margins. It's all about completely rethinking the church, relocating the church away from collusion with power and empire to the margins where it ought always to have been. And we're moreover dealing with profound issues of human condition, illness, disability, racism, poverty, and other forms of oppression, dying. And yet, hand on a heart, I can tell you that in this eclectic, diverse, yes, ecumenical classroom, there is more real unity in Christ than there is in my Orthodox parish that gathers on a Sunday morning. And how is that possible? Well, I think it's exactly what Darcy Lazert was speaking about last night at Evensong, when he channeled the missiological insights of David Bosch, um, and to Bosch I would want to add Leslie Newbegin, uh, the focus here is on a shared vision and participation in God's inbreaking kingdom. And it's remarkable how unified Christians can be when they learn to participate with what the Holy Spirit is already doing. So how does this remain an Orthodox course at Trinity and TST if we're reading the Anglican Sam Wells on incarnational ministry, Catholic Henri Nouwen on spiritual formation for self-sacrificing ministry, Amy Kenny on disability theology, United Church Douglas Hall on the post-Christendom church, feminist Lutheran scholars thinking deeply and radically about Luther's image of a cruciform church, and so on. Well, I think it's because as Orthodox Christians, and this is the way we've framed our program, we try to bring the historic memory embedded in our liturgical and spiritual practice 
of an apostolic church with precisely that eschatological vision of new creation. What I get to do with this diverse group of students is not only share with them in reading and discussing these creative new theologians exploring God's mission in this renewed way, but also to help them knit everything together with the voices of the scriptures and the church fathers and mothers from the early church. And in this exchange of gifts, this receptive ecumenism, I hope ours to Trinity and to the wider TST community is to provide from the depths of our tradition an opportunity to remember before the fractures of confessional, denominational Christianity, to remember even before Christendom. Well, if that's the present, what does the near future hold? Well, I'm tremendously grateful, as it was said in the introduction, to have been tasked just recently to head up an exciting and comprehensive new project here at Trinity, funded by the Lilly Endowment. We're calling the project Reimagining Contemporary Ministries for a Renewing Church, and it's all about enhancing every part of the MDiv program here at Trinity to help form creative pastoral leaders to meet the complex needs of a post-Christendom church. If you want to know more, and I hope you do, you can visit an early draft of the website for the project at reimaginingministries.ca, and I see the link has been put in the chat. As you read through that and what we're proposing to do, you'll hopefully see that it's as thoroughly radical as the name suggests. Reimagining ministry, renewing the church. And it's us all together, Anglicans, Eastern and Oriental Orthodox, and any others who want to take part, with a diverse set of mentors and advisors to prepare our students for creative mission and flexible ministry in the abundant diversity of the church today. Now, you might well ask, what business does an Orthodox priest have in this shaping of the future of the Anglican Church and its ministry in Canada? It only makes sense if what I've just articulated in terms of the post-modern, post-ecumenical even, recovery of that early church eschatological vision of the inbreaking of the kingdom of new creation. What the project has in me is not a narrow denominationally bound leader or pastor or professor but someone committed to following Jesus where he leads, committed to telling and living the story of a much, much bigger God, and therefore a humbler and less petty church than we've allowed ourselves to imagine, and to enacting God's future now in all its differentiated unity and unified diversity. Thank you. Thank you. That's, uh, your course and program sound uh, phenomenal. So thank you for describing them for us. Uh, Dave, uh, former TST student and now with uh, AST, uh, what would you like to share about your context with us? Great. Thank you so much. And uh, I'll echo my colleagues' thanks to Matthew and to Trinity uh, for this event today. Um, I've already been so blessed by listening to the perspectives shared so far. Um, and, and yeah, Matthew, um, I've also been blessed by your film and TV recommendations over the years as well, since we go back to those, uh, those days. Um, so I'll tell you a bit about my context and, and uh, how ecumenism plays a role. Um, so I teach at Atlantic School of Theology, uh, which is a, an ecumenical theological school founded in 1971 um, in the heyday of post-Vatican II ecumenism, much like TST and VST, but it's slightly uh, different in the landscape of theological education because it was founded and it continues to exist as one fully integrated Anglican United and Roman Catholic university. So the local, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the local seminaries of the Anglican church, the United church and the Catholic church in Halifax all closed their seminaries and uh, started one initiative together, uh, one adventure in ecumenical theological education. Um, I kind of, I like to say, you know, just like Jesus is fully human and fully divine, AST is fully Catholic and fully Anglican and fully united. Uh, it, we, we like to say um, ecumenical in a tri-denominational framework. So our experiments in ecumenical theological education are based on a mix of programs that have no particular denominational focus, uh, such as our MDiv or our MA programs, but then we have those that are based on specific constituents, like uh, our Roman Catholic Diploma in the New Evangelization. Now, of course, any student from any denomination or faith tradition is welcome in, to enroll in any program, uh, but there are some that are geared for all students and some geared for students of particular traditions. Uh, much like uh, my, my colleague uh, 
Dr. Topping at VST was saying, uh, you know, the vast majority of our classes in our graduate programs are not denominationally specific. We do have denominationally specific courses like United Church Doctrine, Roman Catholic Apologetics, Anglican History, um, and especially our denominational formation programs within the MDiv. But in most courses, you will find students from all three founding traditions and those of other denominations, Baptists, Presbyterians, Pentecostals, so on. And this extends to our worship life as well. Uh, at, at least pre-COVID, we haven't got back to our, our norm yet from before COVID, um, but we offer ecumenical worship uh, at midday on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday. Wednesday is denominational day, uh, and so that's when our, uh, our, our founding parties have their formation program, and also as part of that, uh, we have uh, Anglican uh, Eucharist, and United Church uh, worship. Um, so it's not only the educational endeavors of AST that, that are deeply, deeply ecumenical, it's also our community and our worship life uh, as well. And, and I echo what's already been said uh, and, and uh, what's been said today, but also uh, makes me think of something my colleague Jody Clark once said, um, that ecumenism is so ingrained into our community at AST, it's such a norm that it's sometimes easy to overlook or forget the fact that we come from different traditions. Um, there are, of course, challenges to this type of ecumenical theological education. In any context of diversity, there are power dynamics at play. And so depending on the event or the context or the program or the class, um, any one of our three founding denominations may hold the de facto power that has to be attended to. And another challenge is, is the sheer breadth and even the division that exists on core theological and liturgical and social issues. For example, uh, the Catholic Church and the United Church have very different doctrines uh, and, and very different views on same-sex marriage. And yet in the classroom, views among students from these and other traditions vary widely from official stances as well. And in the end, these differences come into the classroom, but as students get to know each other, friendships develop that make doctrinal differences secondary to the personhood of one another. There are also gifts that come with ecumenical theological education. Uh, Father Reddy talked about receptive ecumenism, right? This ability to receive the gifts from one another. I also find our students develop a better pre appreciation for their own tradition um, and the tradition of others. It's, it's that paradox where, uh, when the more we learn about one another, uh, sometimes the, the better we come to appreciate our own tradition as well. And students integrate and, and develop all sort of nuances in their views of uh, doctrine and liturgy and practice of their denomination. So while remaining within their particular tradition, um, they develop uh, all these particularities and these, these unique blends of uh, doctrine and liturgy and practice that come with studying different traditions and studying alongside people of different denominations. I, I will say one of the challenges that I think we're, we are facing as AST. And I don't think it's unique to us. I, I think it's something the, the church in the West is facing right now, is that um, it, it, the, the ground has shifted, I think. And it, I'm finding it easier for students of different traditions, different denominations to come together and, and, and see uh, and, and work together than students within the same denomination who are on polar opposite ends. I, I don't like the terms conservative and liberal, but we can just use them for that sake. So I think that's one of the challenges. We tend, AST tends to be more on the progressive liberal side of things. And our conservative students sometimes feel the push that, you know, I'm a member of, the, of one of the founding denominations, and yet it still sometimes feels like I don't belong. So that, that work um, of, of dealing with diversity from within the tradition, I think is gonna be a key marker or a key challenge that we have to face, not just at AST, but, but in the church as a whole going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Dave, for the overview and for, yeah, especially your, your final thoughts there. Is there anything that folks wanted to pick up on from something you heard with, with the other speakers or shall I draw upon a few questions? 
What, what if, okay, there's something I'm um, curious about is that in, in the um, wonderful diversity that we're seeing denominationally, are you hearing from judicatories, you know, dioceses, conferences, et cetera, are there certain formation or theological facets that judicatory bodies are wanting you to instill or, or work on? And has, has that changed over the last 10 years? I guess uh, one anecdote from my own time as a student was I, I proposed to my diocese that because I'm in Kitchener-Waterloo, a very German town, that I do a field ed at a Lutheran church, but my diocese was more comfortable with me at an Anglican church. So um, just because I think their experience of many of their postulants was that they had come from other traditions. They wanted to make sure they were rooted in Anglicanism. So does that resonate with anyone? That particular point, uh, Matthew, was um, something that uh, recently uh, uh, I discussed with uh, Christine Lund, who's the uh, president of uh, Martin Luther University. And um, she said that uh, bishops will not send uh, students to uh, Martin Luther, although uh, Lutheran students can attend uh, Anglican theological colleges elsewhere. So there is, a, there is a kind of breakdown, I would say, at the uh, theological college level uh, in, 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 in that particular respect, which is kind of ironic given, you know, the Waterloo de Declaration and, and uh, the full communion we find ourselves in. Interesting. And I see there's a question in the chat, but would, did anyone else want to piggyback on that or shall we move to the... Well, I can say that I, I've lived this theme in several different manifestations of it, um, and I would say that that it was a it was a very, a very expressly important theme in the United States when I was in institutions there. Um, that that the issue of denominational formation was something that the denominations were paying significant attention to, and I think in the way that that AST and 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 VST um, are one community with with kind of denominational um, opportunities within their communities was something that that the denominations were paying lots and lots of attention to to make sure that the for there were there that that um, the formation in the denominational ethos was happening. Um, it, as I've experienced that in Canada, I think that that is certainly. It's a certainly a, certainly a significant issue for all denominations, but I think it it it's a different it's a different issue in that, um, and I don't know how others on this panel have experienced it, but it's not only are you being formed in this tradition that our school represents. So I'm speaking now; it's an Emmanuel faculty member, and you understand the kind of DNA of the United Church of Canada but also how do you understand yourself as a Canadian relative to that denomination? That to me is, a, is maybe that's the outsider looking in, but, but that to me has been a really strong component of, of the, of the um, education here so that, so that it's understanding yourself um, in your Canadianism in the society of Canada as you live as a denominational person, um, uh, you know, representing a given denomination. And, and so I would wanna add that layer, that, that kind of, the kind of national identity layer as a component with the rest of the kind of religious constellation. Uh, Matthew, just to say at CST, uh, we get this uh, interest from our denominational partners, from all three, about uh, a formation to lead in the context of the Presbyterian United Anglican Church, understanding that the kind of ethos, the value, sacramental leadership is, uh, is an important phrase that, that I've heard. Um, and, uh, you know, it oscillates. We, we do a better or worse job at it as a school. One of the ways we try to deal with it now is we've created a professor of Anglican studies and formation, a professor of United Church studies and formation. We have the same for the Presbyterians. It's a way of signaling 
our commitments to try to do it well in a school where classes are integrated, uh, uh, multi-denominational in single classrooms, but then also going out. So, you know, it's um, it's a result always to be achieved. And just when you think you're doing it well, then you discover there's new, new things coming. Um, I mean, in many ways, uh, uh, the financial end of things, how do you support that is also is also something worth addressing um, because, um, you know, um, theological schools probably raise more money for themselves now than they ever have. And lots of people who were principals have become presidents. And in the, that change of term, it's a change of job function in a lot of ways, which makes you a fundraiser. So. Um, you can get from denominations, here's what we would like to do, and then you raise the money to do it, um, which you know requires a kind of dedication and a partnership and lots of listening um, and being in each other's offices so that you understand. I mean, the dynamics of, of personal relationships. I mean, trust is the commodity that is so important in the midst of that. And not, uh, I, you know, it's easy not to visit him to say, oh, we're doing this, they're doing that. But it really is an important partnership and friendship. And I, I found that talking to, uh, you know, the people or persons responsible often is a great way forward. And you're then learning what uh, the denomination is requiring of their candidates so that, um, you know, you're as much as you can supporting and uh, and learning from that. So uh, it, it's been a hit and miss, and then we try again all the time. So, and, and to be fair, the, the you know the Anglican Foundation um, that you all uh, can draw on is a uh, you know they look for these kind of enterprises so so that there are opportunities to get new initiatives which do this work uh, in place and uh, and oftentimes funding to do it. That's one of the things I didn't say. One of the values of ecumenism is that almost all funds and foundations are looking for collaborative efforts. That may seem a little bit, uh, how should we say, worldly, but, but I think it's important. They want to see us working together to achieve things. And when we do, there, there are funding opportunities available very often, as, as Jeffrey's referred to. Thank you. That's a good good reminder. Let's tap into the the first question that came through from Ian um, about uh, Dave. You mentioned about power dynamics sometimes at play. So uh, yourself or any others on the panel, any best practices or things you've learned from in navigating those dynamics? Sure. Well, I can I can tell you uh, how AST navigates some of those and uh, offer a story about when they a time they really came into focus and something I was working on at AST. Um, part of it is just having practices and policies that ensure denominational representation. So on our board of governors, uh, in how search committees are constituted, um, you know, th there are all sorts of different factors that need to be attended to when uh, forming committees and, and uh, leading the school. Um, and the I would say the first thing, whether or not it, it's an official practice or unofficial, one of the first things is what is the denominational representation? Oh, we have too many Anglicans on this committee. We have to open it up to some Catholics and United Church people. Um, in terms of faculty, you know, there's a mandate that we must have two faculty members from every tradition. So we have two Anglicans, two uh, Catholics. Um, I, I'm Baptist. Um, and we have uh, four, the equivalent of four United Church. It's, uh, it's actually five, but two are part-time fulfilling one role. Um, so even there, you can see that faculty uh, focus or in, in United Church uh, also represents, is, I would say, um, the student body in, in a lot of our uh, in, in a lot of our programs, uh, especially our MDiv program, tends to be mostly United Church, then Anglican, a couple Catholics. Most uh, our, our diocese tends to send their seminarians to St. Augustine's at TST, um, but we have a couple Catholic uh, laywomen right now who are in our MDiv program, um, so it's, it's great to have them. Um, uh, just a, a brief story of when when this came into focus for me specifically. It was my second year at AST. Uh, I was responsible for a summer term and a summer learning program that was started by the United Church and had 
had interest from the Anglican Church, and so there was United Church worship, uh, a focus of that in our summer term, because it was built at a request from the United Church. And as Anglicans started coming in, we, we said, well, let's have Anglican worship too. And I said, well, we're tri-denominational, even though we don't have Catholic students in that program, let's have Catholic Mass. And it became an issue as how is communion going to work, right? And I think just pragmatically, it took a lot of listening to understanding Catholic Eucharist and the and and really um, getting outside of one's own view of Eucharist and trying to see it from a Catholic perspective. And the priest was fantastic at attending to those dynamics. And there were some, uh, I, I would say, some uh, some some early bitterness and 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 anger i think from some protestant students who valued an open communion and so it took a lot of listening to understand um why that couldn't be possible for this specific um eucharist this specific mass this expression of worship so thank you i'm, you know, I'm curious father jeffrey you're operating an orthodox stream and a, a you know long-standing anglican college are there power dynamics at play that you're navigating or uh, or within the classroom, or, or not so much? I mean, I think it, it's fair to say there are always power dynamics um, in play. I think one thing that we can be encouraged about is that people are attending to those in ways that they weren't previously, right? So the question is always being asked, and I think we're, we're glad to be part of that conversation. There's a conversation right now at Trinity, as you may well know, just about diversity in general, about you know, people of color, people come from marginalized backgrounds. And what I've been able to point out is that with this now very sizable Orthodox contingent within the Faculty of Divinity, that's already introduced a fair amount of diversity, people from all parts of the world. A lot of those students have come from backgrounds where they were uh, oppressed and marginalized and, and not at all colluding with empire, etc. So it's similar to what was said before about an Indonesian student who says, well, who exactly are you talking about here? You know, the, um, so I think it, we're, we're a, a hope, a helpful part of a process that we all as human beings just have to carry on doing, which is checking ourselves all the time, making sure that we're not even by the, I mean, I, I often say the very term inclusion can be uh, a dominant kind of term that you use. You sort of assume you are where you people need to be and you're bringing people in. Well, it's, it's even more decentralizing than, than inclusion. It has to be going to the margins, which is why I have a course by that name. And uh, you know, we're part of a, a process here. But I think if you ask our students, um, they have been really warmly, generously, openly received. Uh, and the fact that we have classrooms that are so diverse uh, is to everyone's benefit, really. We, we learn so much from all the perspectives that are brought, whether it's Orthodox from all parts of the world, and both, I mean, it, you know, it should be mentioned, Eastern and Oriental Orthodox did split at, you know, in the fifth century, right? So this is a long-standing thing. The fact that we don't even talk about the fact that we are doing this ecumenically as a thing it has shown just how hard we've worked at you know, overcoming very, very long-standing divisions. But there's all that diversity, the diversity of all the Western Christian traditions that that we're involved in in here, and you know, it, it, but it's a long-standing and 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 ongoing process to always make sure that those power dynamics aren't leaving people out, excluding people, and making sure that you know that everybody's voice gets heard. We have a couple of questions I'll, I'll combine and, and I'll comment. Uh, so Paige has said, um, "Are students ahead of?" theological colleges in terms of doing that uh, um, ecumenical cooperation. So are they waiting for the institution to catch up to them? And then Dr. McCarthy, uh, as mentioned, Saskatoon Theological Union said that the students there were um, engaging with different resources and cooperating and learning from each other very well. And then let's, uh, because it seems related, Bob Betson, who was a, a Trinity student in the late 90s, early 2000s, says that he uh, availed himself of courses all over TST. Is that still happening or is it happening to a different extent? So can we take something from those observations and questions there? And we'll have that as our last question before we wrap up. My understanding is that TST works really well ecumenically at the advanced degree level. So you are inevitably going to find yourself in a multi-denominational context as you take courses towards your PhD, your Doctor of Ministry degree, even THM. 
and so forth. The basic degree, it's a lot harder. So either the MTS or the MDiv or one of the other basic degrees, they have a lot of required courses, uh, particularly the MDivs in the different colleges. And there isn't always a lot of scope for this kind of ecumenical engagement or crossing uh, the campus to go to a different college. I, mean, I feel pr tremendously privileged that my courses are so ecumenically diverse. It means that oh, the few options people have for choosing those extra courses, they're, they're tending uh, to come to us, which is lovely. Uh, but I, you know, and we're, we encourage our students to, to do the same. Uh, in fact, we require it of both the, the Orthodox version of the MDiv and, and MTS that you have courses from um, elsewhere at TST, but it's hard. It's not always easy to find those places. Uh, and, and I think we should work a little bit harder at, uh, at making that possible. Thank you. Any others on that one? Well, I can say that this is an active conversation, um, Divi, because certainly we, what was going on in the 1980s in terms of, uh, and 90s in terms of people crossing campuses has not happened as much in more recent years. Um, <clears throat> and part of that is, is simply enrollment pressures that every one of these colleges is feeling enrollment pressures as the enrollments in, in colleges have declined and have tended to, you know, that between that and between a very, you know, what, what Father Reddy was saying about a very, um, I think that's what I was saying, a very constructed curriculum where there aren't a lot of electives, there's not a lot of choice to be able to go across campus, um, you know, that, that, that all of that um, has, has conspired against people taking many, taking half their courses across campus. It's now, you know, an elective or two probably. The, 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 other, the other question that I wanted to comment on though is about students learning from each other in the classroom. And to me, this has been one of the real, really rich opportunities of teaching both ecumenical as well as interfaith classes. And that is that that when a learning community within a classroom provides an opportunity within the pedagogy for students to be able to speak from their own faith experience and the way in which they're rooted in that, the learning community becomes incredibly rich. And that is something that I have found very synergistic, very exciting and very spirit-filled. And um, I'm, I think there is a lot of that going on across TST where, where, where classes are making room for the, that kind of, of um, um, you know, opportunity to build a learning community where students own experience teaches other students experience and it, and it becomes a, you know, a bubbling pot, so to speak, that's, a, that, that's, that's really a, a rich environment. Yeah, I think I would just uh, sort of add to that too, Matthew, from the TST uh, side of things that, uh, and, and Bob may remember this, that is maybe part of his time there where uh, the colleges collaborated often to um, teach basic level courses. So we had a kind of uh, one course uh, on introduction to New Testament. Um, but, uh, and, and for some reason, uh, by the time I got here, sort of six years ago, uh, they'd stopped doing that. And I think one of the reasons was uh, because of this need to uh, undergird uh, one's own ecclesial identities. And um, so I expect that we'll see, you know, the pendulum shifting, you know, uh, back and forth uh, on this particular matter. And part of the reason is that the students themselves, uh, I find, aren't as kind of ecclesially loyal as, uh, as they were of my generation. Um, they are there because in large, uh, not, not just because a church body has said to them, you know, we think God may be uh, calling you to leadership in, in this church, but because they're on a personal uh, search and, uh, and, and it may well be that uh, they find themselves uh, in, in, in their community within the uh, theological college, uh, they'll find themselves shifting. Uh, in terms of their place where they find themselves most comfortably identified. Um, so I think Paige's uh, question is an important, uh, an important one. Yes, there is a sense in which, you know, uh, theological colleges are kind of catching up to the reality of where our students are. But we're also, you know, in, to, to connect it to the previous question, we're also in a situation where the ecclesial jurisdictions, the bishops and such, 
have particular expectations about what they want uh, in the way of uh, formation. And uh, so it's, it, you know, it is, it is something that uh, it continually evolves. It's kind of an exciting thing uh, for, for someone in the middle of it, uh, the way, you know, we ed educators are. Well, thank you. And I'm, I'm mindful of the time. And hopefully, though, this is just the, the beginning or not the beginning, but a station on the way of conversations that have been going on for a long time and will continue past this. And I'm so thankful to all of our speakers, to all that have joined us online and all that will connect to this later on. Um, I got a message as, as we were in our session from um, President of the Divinity Associates Exec Executive, Darcy Lazert, that he's having internet connectivity issues. He was going to offer some concluding remarks, but due to those uh, internet issues, I will offer some concluding remarks in his stead. Um, I wanted to, um, on behalf of the Trinity Divinity Alumni Associates Executive and the Office of Development and Alumni Affairs of Trinity College, thank you again to all of our speakers of this session and of our four other sessions to those that have been leading and involved in the worship as well. And again, we have 515 Orthodox Vespers. Um, we welcome any feedback about the conference, the content, the format, the speakers, and so on. Feel free to reach out to the Trinity College Alumni Office um, if you have anything, any suggestions. Um, a reminder that although this conference experience has been offered for free, if you're able, we do encourage you to uh, support the Trinity College Divinity Students Bursaries or the Primates Fund for Ukraine. Further information and links are on the event right page or the Trinity College website. We do look forward again to the 515 Orthodox Vespers and uh, we hope that many can join us for that. Uh, I wish all of you well uh, as the, the term concludes and another begins shortly and thank you very much for your time and all the wisdom that was shared. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you. Let us go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen. Peace all. Take care. Thank you.